Glad that you got here safe and sound. And we're going to get into week number nine of our study of the life and times of Jesus here in just a moment. Before we do, if you will bow with me in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we express our thanksgiving and our praise and our adoration for you this morning. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for your word that has the power to guide us and inspire us and correct us and lead us all the way to a heavenly home with you. Thank you for that hope that you have provided in your word and for the purpose that you have provided through your son. We thank you for his great story. We thank you for its preservation and we thank you for the opportunity to drink deeply from it this morning. We thank you for all who have gathered here, for those who are teaching and studying throughout this building. And we pray that your richest blessing would be on all of us as we look into this great opportunity to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. Thank you for our entrance into it by your grace and your mercy. Thank you for the promises of our citizenship in heaven. And we pray that we would be deeply stirred today, that we would be greatly encouraged, that we would be reminded powerfully of who we are by the sacrifice of your Son. And help us to be inspired and focused this morning and throughout the day so that we might live as kingdom citizens in your sight and for your glory and, and for the, the help of other people throughout this week. We offer our prayer at the beginning of this day through the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, Mark chapter 1 is where we are. Verse 21 sets our scene for us where Jesus and his disciples are in the city of Capernaum on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. We spent a little bit of time last week talking about the, the setting, looking at uh, the remnants of what this city looks like on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. From an aerial view, this is uh, over here, modern-day Capernaum and ancient Capernaum. Uh, to the left there, we talked about how there are a number of first century ruins that uh, continue to stand, particularly uh, of note in the city of Capernaum is one of the best examples in modern Israel of an ancient synagogue. You can still see some of the ruins of that and what that looks like from above. That is our setting as we enter into Mark chapter 1. What it would have looked like in first century times, you had an area where people could come and, and ritually cleanse themselves, water coming from the synagogue, and then entering in, uh, and the opportunity to gather together to have Scripture read, uh, to sing together, to read from the law and the prophets, to hear from a rabbi a, a word from the law of Moses or one of the many prophets that could have been read at that point in time from what we refer to as the Old Testament. That's our setting. Mark chapter 1 beginning in verse 21. They went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. Remember, he has already spent some time in the synagogue at Nazareth. And how did that go? He comes back to his hometown. He enters into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He's given the opportunity to read. The, the scroll of Isaiah is given to him. He unrolls it. He reads about that prophecy connected to the year of Jubilee. And he begins talking. And how does that whole situation go? You remember? We studied from Luke's Gospel. Yeah. 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 At first, they're kind of astonished at the way that he is talking. And then the more that he talks, the more aggravated they get. And they get downright angry. 
and are willing to throw him off of the cliff on which that particular city uh, was built. And so, not so well in Nazareth. And Jesus talks a little bit about why that is. Now he has come to Capernaum and he's going to use this as kind of a base of operations throughout the region of Galilee. He's teaching in that synagogue and once again they are astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Scribes would be ones who were responsible for the transmission of uh, the, the law and the prophets from one scroll to another. Remember, they don't have hard drives to save things on and things like that. They have scrolls, but scrolls only last so long. And so the work of a scribe would be to meticulously copy Isaiah from one scroll to another scroll and and, and great care and double and triple and quadruple checking going on about the authenticity of that copying. Scribes were obviously familiar with what they were copying, but they weren't teachers of the day necessarily. Those were more like the Pharisees or the Sadducees. Still great men, still very familiar with what the law has to say. But here is Jesus and instantly they are saying, well, he's not like the scribes with which we are familiar. And immediately in verse 23, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And that phrase is going to be used interchangeably throughout the gospel with someone who is possessed by a demon. It's the first time we've run across this, obviously, in, in our survey of the gospels, but it's not the last time. We're going to learn more and more and more about what this is like and what all it entails. And we'll talk about it in more detail as we move along. But I want you to think about the miracles of Jesus so far. We've run across two in our survey of, of the life of Jesus. Bonus points for who can tell me what those two miracles we've run across so far in, in our first eight weeks of our study. Nancy wants some bonus points. Go ahead. That was the first one. He changed water to wine over in the city of Cana to the west of Capernaum. That was the first one. And what was the second one so far? It was in John's Gospel, Paul. He healed a young man. Yeah, yeah. He heals an official's son, a nobleman's son, who is very, very close to death. And so what I want you to see is we're getting gradually more and more spectacular. Water to wine is one thing. I mean, that's enough to get everybody's attention, obviously. Those servants and the disciples who are aware of how that happened. I can't do that. You can't do that. But it's another thing entirely to heal someone without even seeing them. Without being anywhere near them. That took it up a level, right? But now... Here is someone with an unclean spirit. He is possessed by a demon and he cries out in verse 24, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, Be silent and come out of him and the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him and they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying what is this a new teaching with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him and at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Okay, water to wine, healing a nobleman's son without even seeing that son. And now right here in the middle of the Capernaum synagogue is a man with an unclean spirit 
And Jesus commands that unclean spirit to come out of that man, and He does. What ought we to take away from this account in Mark chapter 1? What ought we to make of this kind of progression? Dave, go ahead. Jason, I was just going to say that uh, you know, Mark spends a fair amount of time in the gospel talking about the miracles of Jesus and, yeah. and, and really to the point to demonstrate the power of Jesus. He had the power of his words to speak and, and things happen. And you know, his power to heal, uh, you know, his power over Satan. I mean, all of these things are, you know, Mark is, is pointing out to demonstrate again from, from that perspective. The, the power that Jesus has demonstrates that He's the Son of God. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. absolutely. Go ahead. There seems to be a correlation. Uh, Jesus has power over the natural world, changing water to wine. He yes. has the power over the physical world, healing a uh, sick person. He has power over the spiritual world, yeah. casting out demons. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you see how it's just taken up one notch at a time. It's one thing, obviously, to have power over inanimate objects, right? But he has that. And then it's another thing entirely to be able to exercise that power in an amazing way in the life of someone else. But both of those are, are very, very this world focused, right? It is another thing entirely to exercise some sort of control over supernatural things. I mean, that's something else. Turn in your Bibles back to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, if you will. As, as people see this kind of thing, again, we, we spent a good amount of time last week in talking about the purpose of miracles. We're going to run across more and more and more of them. I mean, to these people, this was Jesus of Nazareth. And he's a good teacher. He's well spoken. Here he is in our synagogue and he's speaking with authority. And I mean, he, he is head and shoulders above some of the scribes with which we're familiar. But being able to do this, if you're sitting in this synagogue, what do you take away from that as far as this Jesus of Nazareth is concerned? What ought you to do in relation to him? I mean, more and more and more, isn't it becoming clear whatever this man says is worthy of an audience? Isn't that ultimately the point? And in John chapter 12, Jesus gives us a glimpse even beyond this life, kind of like Chuck was saying, and the purpose behind all of this. What's going on big picture wise? We'll pick up in John chapter 12 and verse 27, where Jesus is looking ahead to what's going to be accomplished in Jerusalem. He says, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice, John tells us, came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake. And isn't that kind of, we could say the, the same kind of thing about these miracles. Jesus isn't doing this to verify for himself who he is. I mean, this isn't some sort of an ego trip on, on the part of Jesus. These are being done for the sake of the people around Jesus. Even this voice, he says, that's not to tell me who I am or what I'm all about or, or what I am supposed to accomplish. He knows all of those things. But this voice was for their benefit. Then he says in verse 31, Now is the judgment of this world. And, and listen to these words. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. 
And obviously we're going to read more and more and more about this the further into the life of, uh, of Jesus that we go. And it becomes very clear Jesus knows why He is here. Jesus has come to die. To give Himself as the Lamb of God for the sins of all of the world. Jesus knows what's going to happen in Jerusalem. And we talk a lot about that from passages like John 12. But look at the latter part of verse 31. Or really the whole part. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Who is the ruler of this world? See? That becomes... Very clear, the more that we read our, our New Testaments, we go back to Ephesians chapter 2, and Paul talks to Christians in the city of Ephesus, Jew and Gentile, and says, you once were following the course of this world. Once you were, you had pledged allegiance to the prince of this world, the prince of, of, of the powers of darkness that he's going to develop throughout Ephesians, and how we are at war with those in Ephesians chapter 5. And so not only has Jesus come, to offer the forgiveness of sins. Not only has He come to die as the Lamb of God, but in connection with His death, judgment in this world is going to come. Judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And like I said, we'll flesh it out more and more as we move along throughout this study. But we're given a glimpse, right, into what's going on. And why Jesus is here. Something is going to happen with the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air, at the death of Jesus, something's going to change. Okay? And we won't spoil the complete story right now. We'll, we'll continue to chip away at it. Okay? But that kind of thing is valuable for us as we read this in Mark chapter 1. Before Jesus steps on the scene, someone uh, who, who has an unclean spirit, we're going to read more and more about this. We'll read one uh, about one in the Gospel of John who lives among the tombstones and people try and bind him with chains and there is no way that he can be bound. I, I mean, he is a bad dude to tangle with, okay? But Jesus comes and, and he speaks to that man. And where, where do the demons go? Remember in that particular instance? Yeah, Jesus casts them into a herd of pigs and they run off a cliff into the Sea of Galilee. Okay, It's going to become very, very evident. Well, you know, this man was terribly afflicted before, but here is Jesus and He's able to speak to this man and He's healed. Something fundamentally changes. Casey, go ahead. I was curious. Was this demon seeking him out? Was he was he actually looking for Jesus? Was it the fact that he's in the synagogue? Yeah. yeah. And and the fact that he that, that Jesus silences him. Was he was he there to, to like call Jesus out? <laughs> you know, it's a good question, and and we don't know maybe as much as we would like to know about it, but we do know that when the unclean spirit begins corresponding with Jesus, he's, he's not happy, right? I mean, you go back to Mark chapter 1. Uh, Mark wants us to, to get the idea that this is a, a thing that suddenly happens. Mark likes to use the word immediately in his gospel. We'll, we'll run across that a number of times. Verse 23, immediately in that synagogue there was a man with an unclean spirit. But he cries out and he says, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Well, who is the us? I mean, obviously, maybe is a good question. Yeah, I mean, uh, there is more than one demon that we're going to read about in the region of Galilee, right? And isn't it significant? We even had a, uh, a sermon about it a couple of Sunday nights ago. How any time a demon runs across Jesus, the demons know, right? I mean, th there are doubts in the minds of the people in the synagogue. There are doubts, obviously, in over in Nazareth. But there is no doubt about 
the identity and the power of Jesus in the minds of, of the demon. And so, Casey, to your question, um, whatever he knows, he knows he doesn't want to mess with Jesus. Okay? Go ahead. Well, just the, the fact that, you know, shortly later, we, we hear him silencing them because they're, they're, they're what to call him out. Yeah. He is. Yeah. 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 And that's not the first time we've run across that, right? Where Jesus will tell demon and person alike, no talking. <laughs> Don't tell. And, and we've wrestled with that a little, and, and, and we're going to wrestle with it more as, as we move along. But for our purposes right now, it becomes very clear. I mean, Jesus turns water to wine, and He tells the servants, Don't tell anybody. Uh, Jesus is able to heal numerous people and tells them, don't make a big deal about it. And when there are those who try and push Jesus into a more public light before He is ready to, He will characteristically respond, my hour has not yet come. Um, why He does that? Good question. But you get the idea he is very much in line with the timetable of God. Maybe that's the best way of putting it. There's a plan here that Jesus is exercising. Donna, go ahead. Were those demons an expression of the devil's power? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the more that we learn about demons, the more... And again, we're, we'll, we'll continue to chip away at this more and more. The the more details we get, but you get the idea that there are these evil spirits that were alive and well at that point in time. And we'll go back uh, periodically into the epistles and we'll learn a little bit more about what's going on here. But um, they are in direct opposition, obviously, to God the Father and God the Son. There is no doubt about that. They're created beings and... Uh, they are not in line, not in tune with the will of God the way that Jesus is. And so just continue to wrestle with this. The more that we run across these, the more details we'll get. And like I said, the more that we will um, uh, we'll, we'll try and appreciate what's going on. For our purposes right now, I mean, like Casey has said, Jesus says, be silent and come out of him. And they respond. Right? He responds. The unclean spirit convulsing that man crying out comes out of him. And everyone is amazed. And at once, Mark tells us in verse 28, Jesus' fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Okay? Next scene in Mark chapter 1 and verse 29. Here's another use of that word immediately. Immediately, Jesus left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Okay, You and I, when we think of cities, we think of cities like Columbus. Well, uh, the city of Capernaum was not like Columbus. Maybe archaeologically, historically, maybe a couple of hundred people, if that, okay? Much, much more like a village uh, than, than what we would refer to as a city. But you can see here the outside of the, uh, the remainder of the, uh, the old synagogue in Capernaum, and you see ruins that have been excavated. At one point, this was all underground, okay? It's hard to see. Uh, but you see that line right there? Well, that's, that's earth, <laughs> okay? Uh, where you step up above and, and you would just walk right along there. But you can see how far down these excavations have gone. And you see that all over modern Israel. You see down below uh, the, the remains of, of the ancient city, okay? And you can see this throughout. When we think of houses, we think of maybe... A couple thousand square feet. Well, not, again, not so in the city of Capernaum. You see, as has been built down, we're not dealing with houses of wood. We're dealing with houses of stone and how rooms would have been separated. Here's one room. Here's one room. There's a doorway there. Okay. Uh, this is the kind of house that we're talking about. You see uh, the remains 
uh, throughout. And right there, uh, you remember how I told you last week how the Sea of Galilee is special because they can't build things on top of the Sea of Galilee? Well, they do build things everywhere else in Israel, okay? This is, uh, of course, ancient. This is modern, obviously. This is actually a, a chapel. doesn't look like a chapel. There, there is a, a, a church that gathers there uh, with a, a nice observatory over ancient Capernaum. And directly beneath that, okay, we're talking right here, directly beneath that is what local legend refers to as this house that we're reading about in Mark chapter 1. How they know that? Well, that's why it's local legend, okay? Uh, it, it is one of a number of different houses. It is the largest of those houses. And so, uh, as legend goes, or as popular theory goes, uh, for the number of people who were living here, well, maybe this was the one that Jesus had come to. You see, it's kind of octagonal here and a circular area here that is shielded from the weather by this big, big chapel, okay? But in Mark chapter 1 and verse 29, Jesus comes into this house of Simon and Andrew with James and John, and Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever. And immediately they told him about her, and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them, okay? Just one more, okay? That's, that's the fourth one that we've read about. And that evening, okay, the evening of the day that Jesus has been in that synagogue, remember, everywhere, all throughout the surrounding region, people are hearing about this. That evening, at sundown, they brought to Him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. It does not take news like this long to spread, okay? First time that we have seen Jesus do something like this and crowds, great crowds, surround Him, okay? We're going to see that throughout the region of Galilee where it gets to the point everywhere Jesus goes, people follow Him. Four miracles now. This third one that has particularly gotten people's attention earlier in the day in the synagogue. And at that evening at sundown, all who are sick or oppressed by demons are brought to Him. Whole city is gathered together at the door and He healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And He would not permit the demons to speak because they knew Him. Okay. Now, end of one day. Verse 35. Rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, He departed and went out to a desolate place, and there He prayed. You, turn, or you pull back away from the Sea of Galilee to the north. You can see down here, uh, ancient Capernaum down by the seaside, but you begin to pull away, and we've got the idea now very, very early in the morning. It is absolutely beautiful on the Sea of Galilee as the sun rises. Here is Jesus, while it is still dark, He goes out to a desolate place, and there He prayed. As we read this, what ought we to make of that? of this 35th verse. Nancy, go ahead. Go ahead. Can I ask a question, Jason? How come you skipped over Jesus healing from Simon's mother-in-law? I guess that really wasn't a miracle, huh? Well, yeah, I, I do think it was a miracle. Yeah, I, I read through it, but I, I just chalked it up as one more, uh, obviously, uh, of a number of miracles. Okay? Paul, go ahead. Well, been thinking about that. Okay. And I may be totally off base, but this is kind of... Go ahead. Um, at this time, there was lots of but uh, soothsayers, those that did, did divination and, and, and such. And as Jesus was around all this multitude of these kinds of people, he didn't want to be the same. Yeah. So he spoke everything where they laid hands on and did uh, magic and, and such, which had to be something with a sleight of hand or something. And where Jesus was able just to speak to make him stand out completely differently. 
Okay. Once he enters um, uh, Simon's house, once he enters the house, he is around the disciples. Yeah. He's around the believers. Yeah. Now he can do a personal thing and touch because yeah. he already has the uh, confidence yeah. of, of those. So he didn't have to show that that uh, special talent of just being able to speak it. Yeah. yeah. How's that? I, I think that's uh, that, that's a good point. Great plan. I'm glad they mentioned that he had a mother-in-law because there's some that say that he was the first pope. And yeah. yeah. Peter, you're talking about? Yeah. And they yeah. say they're not supposed to be married, but it shows yeah. that he was married, so that proves that he was yeah. married. Yeah. Peter was married, right? Peter had a mother-in-law right there in that house who was ill on this occasion and. And I, I think Paul brings up a good point. Go ahead, Michelle. Well, Christ set an example for us to pray early in the morning. Yeah. He prayed alone, you know, and so that's an example for us. He okay. As an example of set up There's no doubt about the fact we've got a powerful example there. Definitely. Donna, go ahead. I just wanted to the men find him pray. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about uh, them finding him here in, in just a moment. Donna brings up a good question. I, I mean, what, what is Jesus praying about? Why would Jesus need to pray? Dave? I, I think, you know, he, he's, he's beginning his, his ministry here. And, you know, he, he, knows, he, knows what the, he knows what's going to happen down the road. He knows yeah. the timeline of God. And, and, you know, here he's just starting and, and I mean, you know, reading through what happened in this one day was pretty amazing. Yeah. It had. I mean, if that was what's going to happen, you know, you know, 365 days out of the year, that's going to be draining. Yeah. And uh, you know, I just, I just think he, he shows that, you know, the, the you know, the, the source of his power is through his relationship that he has with God, and he. He prays to him. I mean, later the disciples say, Lord, teach us to pray. I mean, it was so impressive that, to them that he spent the time, that that time in prayer. Okay? Absolutely. Gordon, go ahead. I was just going to, you know, you, the question, why would Jesus pray to him? I remember growing up with my father, some of the most enjoyable, enjoyable memories that I have is communicating with my father. Yeah. And Jesus... Is communicating. Well, yeah. He was also man. He was God with us, but he was man. And he had temptations. He had all of these things. Okay. Yeah. He had man. So, it goes back to the, this amazing fusion of God and man, right? Where there are, are times where uh, Jesus, from a very human standpoint, is going to plead with his father and we we understand that but from the divine side as well when when we read about Jesus praying it's it's just it's precious communion right it, it is spending time with the one who is of the same mind and the same purpose and uh you know there are obviously things we do not know about their interaction while Jesus was here. But Jesus was uh, experiencing something uh, that He had not experienced, obviously, while He was simply in the spiritual realm with His Father. And over and over and over again in these quiet early times, you find them communing together. Ruby, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, he was pressed up on uh, with, with, the, with the demon spirit and also the sick, the evil. I mean, it was like they were coming in rows. Yeah. To, but that on down is, I think he was talking, would have been talking to his father about the whole situation, the pressing, but he had come to preach. Right. And the, not just to yeah, and we're going to read, uh, we've already run across it in John chapter 4, we're going to read it more. Jesus got tired at times, just like us, 
obviously. Um, to to uh, Donna's question, here he is in a desolate place, and in verse 36, Simon and those who were with him searched for him. I mean, you know, here he is, and he's made this amazing splash in Capernaum, and he, they wake up, and he's not there. And... I mean, at this point in time, obviously, they have no idea where all of this is going to lead. But whatever it is, I mean, they want to be a part of it. Because, I mean, they're right there in the thick of things. And there's crowds everywhere. And, and I mean, for the first time, maybe these these lowly fishermen are a part of something that, you know, it's much bigger than them and just fishing. <laughs> and so they come and they find him and they say in verse 37, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. You get the idea. Jesus will frequently use prayer as a time of refreshment from the past, as a time of communion with God in the present, and as a time to prepare for what he is about to endure. And so here he is, he's been in Capernaum, and now he says, let's go to the other towns as well. And it is very, very in line with the character of Jesus that before he does anything of any monumental importance, he'll pray about it. And so what was he praying about? Um, Odds are something about the opportunities to come in the days and, and weeks ahead. Paul, you got 10 seconds. <laughs> uh, well, I was just going to say, you know, it doesn't say that rising up early at breakfast, da, 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 da. his number one priority was to go pray to his, his, his father, which is an example for us. That's our first priority. Thank you very much for being here. Remember that next Sunday, we're really trying to bring visitors. You'll hear more about that week 10 next Sunday. Thank you for being here.